Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of What's Next Live with my dear friend, Roger Martin. He was named the world's number one management thinker by Thinkers 50 a number of years ago, a biannual ranking of the most influential global business thinkers. He's a professor emeritus at the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, where he served as dean from 1998 to 2013. Academic Director of the Michael Lee Chin Family Institute for Corporate Citizenship from 2004 to 19, and Institute Director of the Martin Prosperity Institute. But he has a new book out called A New Way to Think, which we're going to talk about today. I'm super excited to have him on the show. I think you're one of the only that's been here three times. So welcome back, Roger. Thank you for having me all those three times, Tiffany. Yeah, uh, it's it's always, a, always a pleasure to be talking to you. Always. Absolutely. Well, I've been a huge fan of Roger before I had the wonderful, awesome pleasure of meeting him personally. Um, and he was really impactful uh, in my career, in my life, actually. He he helped me uh, find my way through the Thinkers 50 list, which I landed on a couple of years ago and then landed on again, again. most recently. Yeah. So yeah. yes, I am. I am so grateful to you, my friend. But one of the first books I read of his is called Playing to Win. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's how strategy really works. <laughs> so, you know, if you don't mind, Roger, I'm going to go back in time. Yes. And I'd love to ask you if you were to write playing to win today, knowing what, you know, I don't know what year this published, what year did it publish? 2013. So it's okay. getting close to a decade old. Yeah. Yeah. What, what might you do differently? What, what might you do differently? Two things, I think, and I think yeah, I think AG, uh, my beloved co-author, would agree with both of them. One is we would play up even more how important it is to think about where to play and how to win together. Uh, so many people will write me having read the book and then they say, well, I'm trying to do playing to win and we got the winning aspiration all set and then we got where to play all set and now we're stuck on how to win. And I have to tell them the reason you're stuck on how to win is because you've got a where to play already uh, designed. So the minute you lock and load on uh, where to play, it restricts the ways you can potentially win. You've got, you've got to have the two of them kind of work back and back and forth uh, until you settle on both. So that's one thing we ought to play it up more. And the other thing is uh, much more on on the process. There's a chapter in it about here's how you go through the process of creating a strategy, All right? The rest of the book is sort of, if you will, on the content of strategy. Here are the five choices that you've got to make. Uh, here's why each one of them is important. Here are examples of them. Uh, but there was less on if you don't have a strategy you like and you want to have one you do like, what steps do you go through? I would, uh, I would have beefed up uh, that a little uh, to a little greater extent, and as you probably know, you probably followed that. You know, all my medium posts on playing to win practitioner insights, a lot of them are on that latter uh, that latter point to fill in the gaps where people are asking me, "How do you do this thing?" and "How do you do uh, that thing?" So that that those would those would be it. And Lord knows they'll probably ask us to do a tenth anniversary uh, or twelfth anniversary rewrite of it. So those that's good to be thinking about that already. Yeah. And it, where do you think people get strategy wrong in that? Like, you know, uh, let me, actually, let me ask that differently. How do you define strategy? Let me start there. Strategy is making an integrative set of choices that positions you on a particular playing field uh, uh, with a way to win uh, there. And um, how people uh, make strategy mistakes is, is picking a place to play and then engaging in a laudable list of initiatives that don't add up to winning. Uh, they sound perfectly plausible, but if you add them up and say, will you be better than others on that particular part of the playing field that you've chosen? The answer would be mm, not really. And that's just no fun, right? That, that I, I've come to believe like life is just too short uh, uh, for that. Now, some people say, well, you're pretty bloody minded. You, you got to win. So there's going to be a loser. I, I, I don't see strategy that way. I see, I see strategy as encouraging others to play in a different way and perhaps a only partially overlapping space. So you can have lots of people winning. They're winning in their own way, in their own uh, uh, space. 
and that's much better. It's much better for the customers, right? Um, I often say, you know, I use Fidelity and Vanguard as an example. Do Fidelity and Vanguard win? Damn right they do. They're the two biggest mutual fund companies uh, kind of in the world. Uh, but do they go absolutely head to head against one another with the same offering? You know, no. If you believe in index mutual funds and index ETFs, Vanguard. If you believe in a managed fund, you'll, you'll go Fidelity. Who's better off? Customers. They have a choice. Right. Um, shareholders. I mean, they're, they're, neither of them are public companies, but, but the, the Johnson family, Fidelity family is worth about 70 billion last I, last I uh, uh, checked. Uh, and, and Jack, Jack Bogle did, uh, uh, did well, although he, he's a mutual company. So actually all the uh, owners of the funds uh, did, the, did the best. It's just great for humanity when companies choose to do something great somewhere not something average kind of everywhere. Well, I, I think that is a great segue um, because I also think sometimes executives will commit to where they think they're going to win and then they just don't have the, whatever the right word is, courage, fortitude, insight, whatever the word you want to put in there. So a yes. blank, they just don't have blank Yes. to pull back, stop, reassess, pivot, <laughs> kill it all together, right? They're so committed to the win that yes. they're not able to kind of see um, the, the, the forest through the trees, if you will. I think that's right. I think that's right. And, and that, that sort of clarity of sight is, is really important. I think people can, you know, get caught up in their own rhetoric and say, oh, we're going to be the best here. But what, what does that really mean? Best for whom will consumers customers really uh, think that or not. And then it's hard to have the fortitude when it all is very confusing and you can't tell. So if you're not really clear on who you're trying to win with, then as you go along the path, if you, if you take some bumps and bruises, which you always do, it'll, it'll be hard for you to say, well, are we really making progress? Do customers really care about what we, they think we care about? And then you lose, as you say, you lose your fortitude and you just sort of say, you know, gee, I don't, I don't know what to do. Uh, and in due course, somebody will come along and either crush you or replace you uh, uh, with somebody who, who has the clarity of vision that powers the fortitude. Well, all right. So now I'm going to pivot away from playing to win, because yeah. I think that now uh, the next of my favorite Roger Martin books is The Opposable Mind. Ah. It's The Opposable Mind. No oldie but goodie. 2007, that one. Which is winning through integrated thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think that this goes back to, I, I, you know, sort of the thing I often say, uh, it's the name of one, you know, one of my most uh, frequent keynotes is growth is a thinking game, like yes. out thinking the competition. Yes. But there are people who think linearly, there are people that think sequentially, there are think people that think integrated in an integrated way. Um, and when we first met, the conversation we had was around the opposable mind. And it really changed my view of when I was sitting in a room with executives and I would come up with an idea or we're brainstorming and, and they, somebody might have said, well, that's a great idea. Like, could we do that? And then I watched the resistance happen around the idea getting completely shut down. Some of that may be group think, some of it may be other things, but I'd love for you to, to define the opposable mind and, and what kind of led you to, to put it on paper. Sure. So I think of somebody having an opposable mind when they can keep two opposing ideas or models in their mind at the same time. And rather than think that the only choice is to choose one versus the other, because they seem so opposing is to say, Hmm, I don't like either all that much. Could I build a third better way than the, than the two out of the pieces and fragments of those two models? And, and why I put, 
put it to paper is is that I was uh, I, this has been a long time interest back actually from the the book was published in 2007 it, back from the early 90s where I was trying to figure out what do really really highly successful leaders do and studied a bunch of them and came to the conclusion that there was nothing particular that they did uh, that I could identify they didn't all go for growth or go go for profitability or expand into new bar well, you know none of those sort of standard standard things but I, I discerned a pattern of thinking that was consistent and and that's what I described in in uh, opposable mind um, and so so this would be like you know Bob Young, the co-founder of Red Hat, the dominant Linux player who's sold to IBM providing for $40 billion. Uh, um, he saw two worlds, opposing models. He was part of the free software movement, which hated the proprietary software uh, uh, folks. It was, you know, we, we, they each kind of hated each other and said, you either got to be proprietary like Microsoft or you've got to be uh, free software like Yggdrasil and Slackware and, and, and Red Hat. And the reason Bob is a billionaire uh, is that he said, hmm, you know what, uh, this ain't such a great life selling shrink wrapped uh, Linux compilations for 15, 20 bucks uh, in a mail order catalog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, none of us are ever going to make it anywhere on that. But I don't like the proprietary software world because they don't give you the source code so that so that you, you as the user are in control. So he didn't like either model. And rather than saying, well, woe is me, I either have to be one or the other. Um, he said, what, what do I like from the proprietary model? And what he said is not selling licenses. I like service. The service business is a great business helping corporations utilize their, their software upgraded in a consistent way, deployed in a consistent way. I like that business. Um, and what do I like about free software? I actually don't like selling shrink wrap uh, 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 disks, but I like giving them the source code so they can modify it. That is good for clients from his perspective. Could I just do those two things uh, and, have a, and have a better model? And then he came up with the idea, how about this? Uh, none of us Linux uh, types, like if you think of Slackware, great, great confidence building, building name for a, for, for a, uh, a company or Yggdrasil named after a Norse, Norse god. Uh, none of us are credible and big enough to, to, to actually have corporations want us to service their software. Um, but what if we, instead of selling out of mail order catalog disks, we made this downloadable for free from the internet. We could get the biggest market share and be the only credible supplier of services to companies and we'll build a business that way. And sure enough, became 70% share uh, player in, in Linux and the only one that big co corporations would trust and built a multi-billion dollar business. That's what I see is the consistent way these highly successful leaders think. They, they don't, they don't get flummoxed by the labels, free, proprietary. They say, what's underneath that? What's all that stuff underneath that we could combine in interesting ways to come up with a better model? And does that, does that, does yeah, that make sense, Tiffany? Yeah, you no, know, it absolutely makes sense. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I believe that I see it happen in real time all the time, that they feel like it is really an either or conversation Yeah. versus what if we uncover what the best is of each of those considerations, you know, obviously I work at Salesforce. We were a no software brand, right? Yep. SaaS was going to, and it was, we didn't want to be on-prem and, you know, let's go and either create a new um, entire market or disrupt what's going on, right? But now we've seen it sort of fall into the hybrid, which was this sort of opposable mind. You don't have to be all on-prem and you don't have to all be on the cloud, right? I mean, it's it's a way in which everything can work together to get back to that playing to win, right? This is all sort of leaning in towards um, playing to win. Fair? Absolutely. Though, interestingly enough, lots of people sort of say, Roger, isn't there an inherent contradiction between opposable mind and playing to win? And playing to win, you say strategy is choice. And opposable mind, you say don't choose. Don't make a choice. <laughs> yeah. And what, what I say is, you know, nice try. But what I say in opposable mind is don't settle for a choice you hate, right? 
use that as, as motivation for you to come up with a better choice, a choice you don't hate. Uh, and that's what I want out of playing to win. I want you to come out with a choice that creates this fantastic positioning for you in, in the place you, you want to be. So opposable mind is don't settle for, settle for a crummy choice. Uh, playing to win is here's how you make uh, the, the, the choices to win in, in, uh, in strategy. Yeah, and I think uh, I think that people always look for the guidance to the choice. Yes, I mean absolutely look for the the guidance to it, and and I would say that some of it is about efficiency, productivity, <laughs> and you know exactly where this is going, which then yeah. leads me to my next Roger book, when more is not better. So if you don't think I have a catalog of his work. I totally have a catalog of his work. And yes, <laughs> I, I've actually read it all, but these are the ones I wanted to talk about today. So when more is not better is kind of America's obsession with economic efficiency, but I'm going to just keep it on to efficiency for a moment on making those decisions that sometimes people make those decisions. Like I'm trying to figure out where to win. I have to make a decision and they default to the decision of efficiency because of profitability or efficiency because of streamlining or the PNL versus really looking at efficiency in a much different way, which I think you really uh, highlighted. So what is that different way of when more is not better when it comes to efficiency? Yeah, it, it's, it's basically nicely described by the, by the phrase. It's sort, sort of, you know, up to a point kind of more ice cream is better, but if you go on a yeah, duh, <laughs> duh. But if you go on an all ice cream diet, chances are that, <laughs> that's going to end badly. Uh, and so, so the the question is, how do you think about efficiency in a way where you push it far enough to have the productivity uh, enhancement, but don't stop yourself from being resilient. Uh, it's really some kind of a, a balance between efficiency and resilience that you need to uh, head towards. And the book came out right before COVID. And it's, and you know, in some sense, it's good timing was the point was, if you don't pay attention to resilience, bad things are going to happen. We didn't pay attention to resilience <laughs> and really a really bad thing happened, right? right? We were completely right. unprepared to, for COVID because we said it's efficient to have uh, fewer kind of uh, ventilators around. It's efficient to have uh, less PPE in our storerooms. It's efficient to have the absolute minimum number of emergency nurses. And so let's like, you know, downsize our, our uh, nursing staff so that we have the absolute minimum. All of those things had us, in essence, we didn't realize the medical system redlining at the, at, 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 at the base level. And then COVID comes along and it gets kind of uh, overwhelmed. So... So I, I'm all for efficiency as long as you keep in mind that it's got to be efficiency that doesn't undermine your resilience. Uh, and I think with global supply chains now, we're realizing that an efficient global supply chain right, may not be a sufficiently resilient one when the ports of, of uh, Long Beach are tangled for probably 18 months until they untangle it. You're, you may have something you know, manufactured in the Far East in China or, or Southeast Asia that, uh, that has a official parts cost that is 5% lower than if you made it in Mexico or, or in, the, in the US, but it doesn't matter if it's a container <laughs> in the docks in, in, in Long Beach and it's going to rot before you ever, ever uh, uh, find it. So just think about, think about that balance and uh, the world will be here. Uh, better functioning and, and more, I would argue, pleasant place. Well, I, I live in Southern California most of the time when I'm on the ground. Uh, and it was a sight to see looking out at Long Beach, what was off Long Beach, Yes. sort of June, July, August of 2020, September, October. I mean, it was hundreds of ships. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was the strangest view, if you will. And it's not like they were waiting to come in. They were just anchored, and that's yes. where they were, right? Yes. Um, you know, and they knew so, they were going to be there for a long, long. And they knew long they were going to be there. You know, so it was this: you know, drive through Los Angeles Airport, totally empty. Yeah. Go to the port of Long Beach, completely packed. You know, yeah. and and nowhere to go. Um, all right. So now that we've worked our way through, um, we are going to get to his latest book, which I think 
depending on when you listen to this, but the day we're speaking, I think it comes out today or tomorrow. You got it. It is yes. no, today. Today. It's you're, today. Your timing it's, is impeccable as usual, Tiffany. As always. So, well, thank you for spending this day with us. It's such a big day, but his new book, A New Way to Think, uh, is out today. This is the advanced reader's copy, so the, it's a hard copy. Um, but this is your guide to superior management effectiveness. So now we've gone through playing to win, opposable mind. We have just talked about don't put yourself on this efficiency train that then doesn't set you up for resilience. And now we're down to a new way to think for management effectiveness. So I feel like, you know, if you're a first time manager, if you're a manager dealing with a ton of change, if you're uncertain about how to navigate this, the series of these four books is a great place to start. Now, I know we're going to talk about a way to think, but in what order would you recommend people to read the four I just, regardless mm -hmm. of publication date? It, it, I'll, I'll, I'll give two ways. It depends on, uh, on how you like to think. If you like to get the big picture first, I would do one more is not better uh, first. Um, then I do uh, playing to win because there's no strategy in general. Then I do opposable mind, which is a sort of a way to deal with a certain kind of strategy dilemma. And then I do a new way to think because it's got, it's got 14 independent chapters that as soon as, as that new manager, you've got a problem that looks like chapter four, just read, spend 20 minutes reading chapter four, and then dive into that problem. That would be going from the macro uh, to the micro. The other way to think about it is, is, uh, just have new way to think as your reference manual uh, and look at the chapter headings. And when you've got a problem, uh, uh, do it. Uh, then uh, uh, then opposable mind, then playing to win. And then finally, if you want to understand how all the, the pieces of this puzzle fit together, do, uh, do when more is not there. All right. So you heard it here. That's the order. Um, <laughs> and so now a new way to think. First, what inspired you to write another one? Like you're prolific, right? You write often. It's always around management and strategy. It's, it's, it's a light, good, informative read for someone who is a listen visual learner. I can get through Roger's books um, uh, quite easily. Um, what, what got you to write A New Way to Think? What was the, what was the trigger for you? Well, <laughs> It, it, all of my books are in some sense self-help books, Tiffany, right? They, re they really are. I, I, I try to think about what, what managers would need to make their life easier, more effect, uh, effective, uh, more pleasant. Um, and and I've, I came to the conclusion that there were a bunch of management models that get to be kind of the accepted model in, an, in across management that everybody defaults to. It's almost like they take it off the shelf. They say, oh, I've got a, this problem. So I'm going to take that model off, off the shelf. And I'm just going to apply that kind of unthinkingly because it's, it's the way things are done. And I just increasingly saw a bunch of them as just, maybe they were never right. Maybe they used to be right, but aren't useful now, aren't useful to managers. In fact, it takes them down uh, the wrong path. And so I said, why don't I just tackle them? There are a whole list of them that I that I object to, uh, and think there's a better way. And I'll write a, a write a, a book that is that is a compilation of chapters, each on a model that I think is unhelpful. And of course, I'm a practical guy. I'm not going to say stop using this model and stop using this model and stop using this model and give them nothing to go on. No, I'm going to say. Uh, uh, stop using this model and instead use that model. So that that's kind of the the inspiration, and I and I kind of realized that that's how my mind works. Um, if you if you if you just look at everything I've I've written, which which you which you do, Tiffany, bless you. I think that's a, a sort of a theme. I want to leave people with a model in their head that helps them get through some you know difficult or complex or challenging situation. And that's what this book is designed to do. Well, so his part one <clears throat> is called Context on Context, which was my part one in Growth IQ. So great minds think alike. 
Um, and under context is competition, stakeholders, and customers. Um, the part two is making choices and making choices, uh, strategy, and data. The third part is structuring work, which is culture, knowledge work, corporate functions. And then part four is kind of the action items, I think, the key activities, planning, execution, talent, innovation, capital investment, M&A. So if you were to say, right, once again, your, your advice is if you're, if you read any of those, for example, customers, as an example, you're trying to figure out who is our customer, what's happened, what's going on, where do I want to focus going forward? Your suggestion is just to read deep into the customer chapter. Fair? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And, and what did you find? I'm just going to sit on that one for a second. What did you find in customer that might have surprised you that you thought going into it? Because I think so much of what the customer stood for and stands for has changed. And depending on what market you're in, what region, what industry, what size, there's lots of context questions underneath that. But the customer is really different than they were two and a half years ago. Yes, yes. Though there is something that, that I would say is, is consistent about them. And that's what this chapter is about, which says we're obsessed about customer loyalty, uh, uh, which, which I, I, in some sense, I don't, I don't object to Fred Reichelt of NVS fame is a, is a, is a friend, of, friend of mine. But we, we think that the, that the most important thing to do is to promote customer loyalty. And what I would argue, argue and do in this, in this chapter is that there is something more important than loyalty that operates different than loyalty. Loyalty is a, con uh, is a conscious concept. The idea that, gee, I bought this five times uh, uh, before and because I've had a good experience, I will be loyal to that. A conscious act, I'll say I should buy that again. Turns out that the brain science is crystal clear on that, that it's like an iceberg. That conscious part is 5% above the waterline, 95% below the mar uh, is the unconscious, and there is a habit. So what you actually have to have happening is that you help a customer create a habit for you and then don't do anything <laughs> to interrupt that habit. Uh, and companies do lots and lots of things that in interrupt habit because they think that customers operate at the conscious level to a much greater extent than the unconscious level. And we've got one of these things going on right now with the great resignation, Tiffany, right? Co companies are flabbergasted by this great resignation. And, and uh, instead of people happily coming back to work, uh, they're, they're handing in their resignation. Why? Well, that's because COVID was a great interrupter of habits, the habit of, of getting up in the morning, getting on the bus or the train or into your car, driving to work, parking, going to work, and then, uh, and then working for the day and battling traffic on the way home. For anybody doing that, that was their habit. It was their default. Their subconscious was saying, this is what we do. You know, we do this every, every day. We go. That habit got interrupted by COVID. And people were were required to work remotely, right? Which is to work in your home. You set up a home office in your basement or your you know sitting room or where, wherever you did, and spent better part of two years doing that. By that time, that was your new habit, and your subconscious, which is your subconscious, what we know from brain science, loves familiarity and comfort. You are familiar with that and comfortable with that, right? Totally established. Then companies said to you, hooray, COVID is over. Now you can come back to the office and stop working remotely. Do you know what the subconscious heard? Fight or flight. <laughs> <laughs> well, the subconscious heard, heard, you want me to start working remotely, right? The new remotely is the office <laughs> to the subconscious. It is, it is. And they said, whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. That's something new. That's something new. I'm going to step back and think about whether I want to do that or not. So typically habit has this huge advantage. It's, it's like literally 
habit uh, gets to, whatever your habit is, gets to start a hundred yard dash at the 80 yard mark. And every other alternative starts at the starting line. The gun goes off and guess who wins all the time? Habit. The habit. Yeah. yeah. The minute you interrupt a habit from which you benefit as a, as, as a company, you send it back to the starting line with every other uh, option. So they had this huge benefit of the habit is you're working for them, right? You happen to be working at the place you call the office, which happens to be home, right? And then they say, break that habit and we'll see you at work. That job goes back to the starting line and gets evaluated against all others. And massive numbers of people are saying, that new thing called going to that office and these five other things I could do, like get a job that's local, not get a job at all, do gig economy, whatever. Uh, I like those better and I'm out of here. Yep. So that's not paying attention to habit and the incredible power of habit and taking care of, uh, of habit. Well, I think <clears throat> that was probably one of the best explanations I've had around why the great resignation is possibly happening, right? Yeah. Um, I think that uh, back to what I said, you know, selling to customers who are in an office is very different than selling to customers who work out of their home. You, meeting them face to face in their home is not usually, you know, what is expected, right? So, um, listen, Roger, I am grateful that you chose to spend launch day of your new book, A New Way to Think, with us here on the What's Next podcast. I am forever grateful for your friendship and support. Um, any last parting words you have with our listeners today on how they can keep in touch with you? You mentioned your Medium blog, but um, any place else uh, that, that you are frequent? Sure. All, all, all of my uh, work I've organized uh, on my uh, website, which is rogerlmartin.com. You got to remember my middle initial L or it'll go to a very friendly uh, and nice <laughs> real estate uh, worker in Houston who has to forward <laughs> things to me. So, so rogerlmartin.com is my website. Uh, you can find me at rogerlmartin on Twitter. And yes, I have this medium series every Monday for the last 80 weeks. I've posted something that's practitioner insights for playing to win uh, uh fans so well, we'll, uh, we'll be sure to put that in the show there. notes terrific all right well thank you again roger thanks everybody for joining us today on the what's next linkedin live podcast i'll see you on the other side thanks again thank you tiffany